See all these people out here? Yeah. I found out before we came in, they paid on an average of $12,500 to come to this conference. Yeah. I want to ask you a question, Steve. Did you get any of that money? I got half. You got money? I got half. I got nothing. That figures. Mel Milken gave my part to Schwartzman. <laughs> you know, I remember, I remember in the, in the old days before Mike got big, we used to be in the big room. We were in the ballroom. We had a moderator. Now, we're in a tent. We got no moderator. So, and, so let, let and, and wait, wait, it's worse. We got this Fakakta con, uh, con, uh, pro, uh, subject. High, building to touch the sky and change the world. What kind of topic is that? <laughs> it's a little weak. So what I did is I called up Benny Allergen that owns this place. And to, to help all of you, you think of this next 30 or hour is a break. <laughs> but we got for you cookies. We can sit down. Now. <laughs> so we ordered cookies. Pretend I, you're at the wind. So the first thing is... <laughs> So, so the first thing is, is that given a choice between looking at Jim and looking at Andrea, I prefer. You two switch. Stand up, stand up and switch seats. Come on, let's go. Uh. Come here, my the right attitude for this? There's an element of levity. This is That's Mrs. Wynn. And by the way, it's a very simple thing, okay? So, Wynn and I belong to the same club. We, we both married over our head. And so you look at her, you look at him, you, look at, you sit back and relax, son, okay? <laughs> you, you look at him, you look at her, you look at her, and who got the better of the deal? So, Wynn's reaction to that is, he says, I'm a deal guy. Of course I got the better of the deal. So anyway, uh, Jim, you're lucky you'd be there. You could be there. You think that we've started off with the right element of seriousness and purpose here? So I talked to Milken um, uh, a little while ago, and I said, what's going on here? We have a Fakakta topic. We don't really understand though, what the topic is. We have no moderator. We have no so he said, first of all, ad lib. Second of all, interview each other. So you start. Well, <laughs> first of all, I've been bugging him if they want to have structures to the sky that change the world, they should have this conference at the Wynn. We already built one of those. <laughs> Secondly, we would serve cookies automatically. But I did order cookies for all of you. But you went to Dartmouth, I went to Penn. I've been watching television and observing the way the faculties have become. I think we should build a very tall building, a JV, with one door in and no door out and put the faculties of Penn and Dartmouth in it. <laughs> What's your point? What are you trying to say? Too liberal. Too liberal. Right. Did you all get to sign the paper on the way in, whether you're Democrats or Republicans? <laughs> if there's any, if, if there's Republicans in the room and, and less Democrats, we can take off the body armor. So how long have you known Milken? He was 32, I was 36, I'm how, 75. Well, you're 70, I'm 75 also. How much more do we have to go? <laughs> are we doing good so far? <laughs> Structures, structures to the sky that change the world or anything else that interests us. We're going to leave time for questions, but this, this conference, uh, along with you, we have been attending these, these, these sessions, and they're quite extraordinary. Uh, Masa-san was here. The head of the World Bank is here. Schwartzman was speaking. Michael has managed to cover every subject from medical research, politics, the environment, business and investing, Asia, Latin America, Europe, whatever, and they've dealt with outer space. I've, I've been struck by the, the enormity of the range of subjects, but more importantly, they've highlighted what, what Josh Ramo has written in his book, The Seventh Sense, that says the networks the connectivity of our society has changed everything. The traditional power structures of the great, from the Roman Empire to post-World War II America, China, Europe, Russia, the Soviet Union, all that power has gone away. And today, more than we realize in many cases, 
power in the world is all about the connectivity and the networks and the gatekeepers of those networks who have been here at this conference, but they control our lives. And whether we're building buildings or having a service business like resort hotels, I'm struck with the fact that as Josh Ramos says, we're all gonna have to develop a seventh sense, which he refers to as the ability to understand the impact of networks and technology on our lives. This conference, as far as I'm concerned, Steve, has highlighted the enormous moment of revolution that has gripped our lives. And the question is how, how we all going to be, how are we going to handle it? How are we going to leverage it? How are we going to maintain human supremacy when artificial intelligence in an age of, of Yoda flops, a Yoda flop is a chip they're making now a Yoda flop is 10 to the 24th power of points of light, or to put it simply, a one or a zero, per second. A chip that has a Yoda flop can do 10 to the 24th points of light, an eye, a single point, a yes or a no, per second. Uh, I'm not sure I followed all that. Technology. I'm not sure I follow all that, but let me let me give you something that's right down your sweet spot. So okay, do it your way. There's a lot of talk in this conference about the economy, about growth or lack thereof, about globalization, about uh, technology, about robotics, about unemployment, 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 and what effect it will have on the universe. So um, uh, at Penn and Dartmouth, the fancy schmancy. That's a term of art. The fancy schmancy uh, sociologists uh, are beginning to predict that there may be, 15 years from now, 25% unemployment globally. 25% unemployment. Now, what does that mean? Well, it either means that we have 25% of our population is destitute and, and all of the issues that that cause. It may be that there will be a government subsidy to the population to handle, handle the unemployment, or e most likely it may be that people will work a four-day week or a three-and-three-quarter-day week and still make the same wage. If that happens, there will be an enormous amount of leisure time for the population. It will be, the, the quality of life presumably will improve, there will be a lot of time, and that plays right into your sweet spot, which is entertainment, family values, um, uh, resorts, and what have you. How is, if, this, if you take my assumption that there will be a four-day week work, let's just think about that for a minute, okay? So what does that mean, and how do you react to that? I, reacting to your first point of what the future portends. I know, wh whenever I'm faced with a tough problem at my, my job, I have a, a procedure that has served me well these years. I back up away from the conflict or the perplexity of the moment. Back to, I back up to a point where I come to a truth that I'm sure of. In my business, it's guest experience. And then I proceed from there. In this particular case, what do we know in this room, every one of us, we know that the only chance for... By the way, I want you to be talking to your people and their yeah. money went to Schwartzman, not my people whose money went to me. Okay, go ahead. The only po possibility for a better life is the demand for our labor. And you point out that that may be in question and have severe implications. I believe... We have, we have to have a plan B. I say... We have to have a plan B. And that's what I was trying to get to and I'm, I'm not doing a good job, I guess, but... No, go ahead. I'll cut to it. The purpose of government is to create demand for labor. Demand for labor occurs in the private sector. We know that at every point in human history, human ingenuity, the human drive for a better life, greed, ambition, call it what you want, has managed to, to produce the results, technology, new businesses, new ideas, that have created the demand for human labor. It appears at the moment that you can discuss technology creating less of a de demand for human labor. But I wanna point out that for the past several generations, there has been an increasing mounting barricade 
to the release of human amb ambition by our government. First, by mounting mountains and mountains of regulations that seem to multiply on themselves because they do. And secondly, by a government that has not understood that the greatest single point of leverage, the thing you bring to the problem of modern civilization is a big idea. And what is the big idea that is so common to us everywhere but government? How do we train children? How do we train a dog? How do we train a dolphin? By rewarding and incentivizing the behavior we wish to encourage. Our government has been using its single most powerful point of leverage, tax policy, as a stick, not a carrot. If we wanted to reward the behavior we're after, creating jobs, by incentivizing and reinforcing that behavior with our tax policy, we would see job creation in corners of this economy and in ways that we as a group today can't predict, nor have we ever predicted it. What we have missing in our government is a big idea, an idea big enough to unite everybody. I'll give an example. You want more efficient government you got 465 agencies in the federal government, 2,650,000 civilian employees, not counting a million and a half in uniform. You want, you, want to, you want to fight with the union, the Civil Service Act? Change the subject. Tell every department, put them in small groups. Your budget last year was X. Next year, make it $1 less than X, and 20 cents on every dollar will give you as a bonus. You want to see government shrink? You want to see teachers do a better job? Don't argue about the union. Restrain the collection of taxes and tell the teacher if she can get the kids in any grade, they can get 90% of them to pass a test that the parents and the PTA organization has done with the teachers, uh, uh, the school board will give them $75,000 of tax-free income on a joint tax return. Change the subject. Tell American business, when you create jobs that are sustainable with health insurance, we'll give you tax credits, we'll make arrangements. President and I had a conversation. I have access to my friend of 32 years because I'm working as the RNC chairman. Imagine you say we want to have an infrastructure bill. We want to bring money overseas to the United States. And we want to do it for 10%. I say, Mr. President, a week ago, don't bring the money to Washington and piss it away with 35 or 40 percent of bureaucratic over, over expenses. You tell businessmen, you show me a sustainable job. I'm going to have a committee that does, that a sustainable job that increases your payroll. And for every million dollars in payroll, I'll give you 10 million of money you can repatriate from wherever you got it. You want to see money come back? reward the behavior you wish to encourage affirmatively. We don't do it in Washington. The strongest single big idea that controls life outside of Washington and government has been lost. And my answer to the dilemma you pose, Steve, is that I don't have the answer. I think I understand the big idea and procedure that would evoke the answer from other people. Maybe some of them sitting out here, they're smart enough to pay 12500 to get here. I ought to be able to figure that out. That's my feeling on the subject. So you're going right into the belly of the political debate. So uh, a simple question. How do you think uh, the president is doing so far? And the second half of that is, what are your ambitions for him? I've heard you talk about this last night. And... You've known him longer, as long, as longer, longer than I have. Both of us, 30, 40 years. We both went to military school. Uh, I think he made a great choice of cabinets. And that hasn't been that good. If you take a look at what a guy does, if you look at the substance of his positions, lower regulations, tax reform, an immigration system that's based upon the contribution made to the welfare of this country. If you take a look at fixing the catastrophic affordable health care bill, I've been a health care provider for 49 years. 
It is a subject with which I have intimate familiarity. The 2,700 pages of the Affordable Health Care Act, and I told Harry Reid on the phone, you're going to increase the cost of health. I told Harry, you've, you've, you've accomplished the equivalent in bowling of the 7-10 split, the hardest spare to make. <laughs> you've screwed management and labor simultaneously with the same piece of paper. Can I interrupt you for a second? So the president wants to fix it. I think his basic ideas are, are great. Can he bring Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan? Basically, the president's job performance is going to be determined, in my view, domestically where it really counts, in the ability of the Senate and the House to produce legislation that they have advocated as the right answer for America. And in order to do that, it's my, my opinion that Mitch McConnell is going to have to deal with the, with the supermajority requirement to stop uh, filibuster. I, I think the Democrats, based upon their behavior on Judge Gorsuch, will do anything to stop constructive action on the other side of the aisle, which is unfortunate. So McConnell is going to have to deal with that, and so will Donald Trump if he wants to get his program through. I think he wants to do it, Steve, don't you? You talk to him all the time. Yeah, sure. Um, I have a slightly different take. Um, I think the president has more... Uh, power, if you will, or more discretion, if you will, or more ability to get things done in the international arena than even in the domestic arena. Sure. Um, and so I think that he is very interested in making his mark and um, improving. Um, I mean, he describes it, he inherits a mess. Uh, that's perhaps too pejorative a comment. But there's lots of things going on, especially over in the, uh, in the uh, Middle East and the China Sea region and what have you, that need attention and need it badly. I mean, the West Coast of the United States is very concerned about uh, what's going on in Korea and all of the, um, all of the uh, threats, et cetera, there. So I think that the president is spending an enormous amount of energy on that, as well he should. Let me ask you a question, because you, you raised the specter of health care. Why, in God's name, does America the Beautiful spend double on health care of any other country in the free world for basically the same outcomes? What's your theory on that? One of the main reasons is the widespread, wonderfully widespread use of the most exotic and modern diagnostic and scanning techniques that have been developed primarily in this country. They exist elsewhere, but not on an, a scale because of free enterprise. In Las Vegas, Nevada, there are five to 10 major diagnostic centers in the valley, equipped each with 25 or $30 million worth of equipment from ultrasounds to exotic scans to machines that, uh, you know, that do all kinds of radioactive imaging. These devices, of course, are have to be manned by highly trained and high, highly paid people, as they should. When used properly, <clears throat> these devices save lives or extend lives and relieve pain and suffering. However, because of the particular nature of our litigious system and the third party payer reality of modern healthcare, it is these devices and the people that are highly paid to, to run them are used on an intensive, much more widely based scale than any other country in the world. We do MRIs, CAT scans, uh, ultrasounds, nuclear scans of coronary arteries on a scale that dwarfs any other country. So there's a real solid reason why we sort of spin off now, these doctors are not doing this because it is radically important. They're doing it to cover their ass because they're afraid of lawsuits. <laughs> and when Texas, for example, capped pain and suffering <coughs> at 500 Gs, the first year, malpractice premiums dropped by 43%. The Affordable Care Act in 2,700 pages did not touch pain and suffering, which is a BS subject for plaintiff's lawyers. These kinds of things are, they exist in other countries, but on a scale in America 
of enormous, enormously large basis. This particular thing is one of the reasons why we spend or so much money is spent on health care when it shouldn't be. You combine a litigious society with widespread, expensive, sophisticated equipment, and you've got a perfect setup for abuse. Because I think if we're honest with each other in this room, if someone else is paying for something, ladies and gentlemen, is there anybody in this room that honestly cares what it costs? There is the answer to one of the biggest problems. That's why the big idea in Washington and our approach to health care has been wrong. You can be as compassionate as you want, but put someone, have them some skin in the game. Figure out how to incentivize people to do the right thing. And you solve a problem the old fashioned way. With regard to unions and education, if someone guarantees your financial security, are you on their side or aren't you? So when a union guarantees the members financial security or, or safety, of course the teachers are on their side. You want to change education? Change the subject. Give the people an incentive that's separate from a union that's linked to what you want. Educate the kids. Teach them long division. Maybe a little bit about the century that Abe Lincoln was in. But we don't do that. In public policy, if I were a president, I would come to that job with one big idea. An idea so simple that it would resonate with the common sense of every person, Democrat or Republican. Reward and incentivize the behavior that we wish to encourage for the benefit of all people. But I think what you're saying, as it relates to the legislation that's being considered in Congress now, vis-a-vis -vis health care and Obamacare, et cetera, it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. What we have now. It, it's not going to get the job done. The people in the, in the Freedom Caucus are highly principled people. Are they friend or foe? And they're, they're completely comfortable in their own conscience with the integrity of their own positions along values that you and I would probably agree with. The people in the Tuesday group, they, are, they have something in common. They're called moderates. In fact, who they are, in fact, who they are for your benefit is that they're the people in the swing districts. That is to say, they are at risk in every two-year election. The people in the Freedom Caucus share an interesting commonality. They are in districts that are not at risk every two years, except in a primary, but not from the other side. This explains some of the conviction that the more conservative members have, the more comfortable they are in maintaining their own intellectual position. The, Freedom, the Tuesday group, they think, my God, if I take away any part of this expanded Medicaid, I'm gonna not be here in two years. And they look at the, the other guys and say, what good is it if you do this to me? We're not gonna be in the majority in 18 months. I'm gonna get whipped. So here we have two groups, both of them with their feet planted firmly on sound ground and comfortable as they can be in their, in their, in their positions. Now there, there's a situation. Who is it that has to compromise in a situation like that? But, you, but, but Steve, what you just described doesn't create a voting block and a voting caucus. Yes, it does. Once the men who are in the Freedom Caucus realize and they have enough experience to understand in order to survive as a majority, in order to accomplish this, they are going to have to do it in steps because they have to protect their fellow congressmen in their own party, in their re-elections in the midterms. And, and, and that, that will evolve, but it, they don't seem to get that message yet. They, they do, they do. You, what happened, Steve, because I'm talking to these guys. Show me, show me the vote. Here's the trouble. They have been able to roll around in their own little bucket 
with freedom because they had no chance of winning. Remember that movie years ago with Redford, the candidate? Yes. The guy said, you could say whatever you want. And Ken Redford, the candidate, says, well, I've never been in politics. I don't know what to do. He said, it doesn't matter. You're going to lose. <laughs> they know that, they, that what they were saying had no consequence. So the Tuesday group and the other guys all had a party. Now, the, the responsibility and the consequence of being in a position of power and, and consequence has come upon them and they're learning about it. And if you, the rhetoric in, in ways that are significant but subtle changes every day. As these men and women come to grips with the, the challenge of governing in a democracy, what, what's your prediction for the tax uh, reform that's now beginning to uh, unfold? Well, same as yours, I would guess, right? We, mm -hmm. We'd like to see a tax policy that encourages and incentivizes job creation. Job creation creates happy humans, but more importantly, it creates taxpayers. Simplification, competitiveness are the two keys in my mind. Not to mention the death tax, but that's a different issue. But that, that's something that, that... That's something different. We, yeah, yeah. We love that because we want to pass on stuff to the kids. But uh, I, when I was in the White House uh, uh, a week and a half ago, I said, Mr. President, I was in there. It was, it was Gary Cohn and I, and, and, and Tom Barrick was there, the three of us. I said, it seems to me that the, the three words that we want to concentrate on... If, you know, I was there giving feedback on my conversations with state chairmen and donors of the RNC. Well, well, while you're on it, you have a very big new position in politics with the Republican Party. Can you describe that? I think it's very important. Well, I, I got roped into this really crazy job where your friends don't return your calls anymore. Uh, but I said the most important thing, it seems to me, based upon what I've learned as the RNC finance chairman, is take home pay. That's the one. Now, don't worry about me or guys that are very successful and are privileged. Worry about the people that elected you in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan who had their first taste, the real taste of redistribution. If you want to redistribute Warren Buffett or, or Steve Roth's money or win, yeah, sure, the hell with those guys. They're rich SOBs. But when a guy working for wages and trying to get by and noticing, not understanding what the deficit has done to his dollar as we print two billion a day and increase the money supply, he doesn't understand that, but he notices that he's struggling. And not all of a sudden, with the exact same coverage, the cost of his health insurance has gone through the roof. And he asked someone a job in a position of authority, uh, 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 what just happened here? Did I get something new? Because I'm paying a G note a year, 800 or 1200 a year more. No, no, you, it's the same policy. Well, why? Why am I paying more? Well, you, you, you have to understand that's necessary so that we can give this other person free coverage. Oh, well, no one asked me. <laughs> There's a woman named Amnity Schlade who wrote a book called The Forgotten Man. It's a tremendous book, Amnity wrote, she's a wonderful woman, and it's a review of the 30s and the Depression and what happened. And during the 30s, when Roosevelt was doing all the redistribution and creating all these welfare programs, a very famous professor at Yale wrote a, an article that was highly, highly reviewed and well and discussed called The Forgotten Man. And to summarize, the Yale professor said, and I'm going to simplify it, that A, a group of humans, A, decided that B was underprivileged and in need of help, and therefore C should pay for it. The Forgotten Man in, in terms of the Yale professor's article, wasn't B, it was C. No one asked him. Donald Trump, somebody told Donald, I'm sure, in the campaign about Amnity Schlade's book. 
and, and, and the true meaning of, of the, the forgotten man. Incidentally, uh, uh, Johnson and Obama picked up the forgotten man theme and they put it on B, the guy that got the money from C. That was the forgotten man. We're going to take care of the forgotten man because we're cold-blooded in, in our society and we need to be more compassionate. Well, if you have a false premise, you can say anything after that. Somebody told Trump that about C being the true forgotten man in the original story by the Yale professor. And that forgotten man is the guy in the union. And Barack Obama surgically separated union leadership from the membership in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And that's why Donald Trump is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Because a huge portion of blue collar America woke up to the fact that they were being redistributed without their consent and they don't like it. And we're going to see more of that. Obviously, you guys in the room that look at this differently, you ladies and gentlemen, you know you're looking at a, a Republican, a conservative. <laughs> and, so and let, me, let me establish something. You described yourself and others a moment ago as being rich SOBs. So from your point of view as a member of the rich SOB class. It's worse. We're, how se much, we're 75 and rich. How much did you start with? If you're a rich SOB, how much did you start with? Zero. But you okay. can make that a short answer or a long answer. I started the answer everything is, the answer and is, nothing. The answer is zero. Zero of money but 100% of the tradition, the culture, and the guidance from my parents that it took to change that status. To that extent, I was completely privileged. It just didn't show up in a checking account or a bank account or a financial statement. For that, I had to go hustle on my own. But you are a rich SOB who is a product of the great American dream. You bet. Okay, next question. So it seems to me that this, the stats are that America's school system, K through 12, is ranked 27th in the world. Not third, not fourth, not seventh, not 27th in the world. So that's an enormous issue um, in terms of how our society functions. The second half of that is, I think the statistic is that America the Beautiful has 40 million people that live below the poverty line, are uneducated, unemployed, and unemployable. So you put those two things together, and then we have a very decentralized school, school uh, system. It's done very, very local, very towns, hamlets, burgs, counties, whatever. You've obviously done an enormous amount of thinking about the system and politics in this country. What's the answer to the education issue in this country? You did a perfect description of the bleak realities of our day. No, no, no. I want the solution. And by the way, remember, you have the president's ear. So do you. I know. What are you oh. putting it on me for? No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> All right. I'm in the counter-punching business here. All right. Go ahead. All right, let's get to it. Yes, let's, this this is may not be why you came. This is important stuff. This has got nothing to do with skylines. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. How many people are in this room? 200, 400? Uh, a see. couple of hundred. Uh-huh. All successful. Uh, probably a couple of stragglers. Go ahead. Came here. Came here to find out how to make more the money. Guys, the, 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 how, the rich fish are in the front row. How to network. You, you can't take 10 steps without someone shoving a business card in your hand. All right. You're ambitious. You're with it. You're connected. You're here. Where are you going with this? What you gonna do? You gonna sit there and listen to guys like us? You know the size of the problem. You didn't <coughs> need him to say it, and you don't need me to repeat it. But I told you what we gotta do. You gotta get in the game. You gotta decide that you're gonna fix it. And hopefully, you'll have some consensus about the track or the program that'll work. But the fact of the matter is, turn this around. There's a bunch of us in the room that have capacity and understanding, and we've been exposed to some of the smartest people that walk earth. Fine. Okay, we got a clear understanding of the problem. 
No need to repeat it. What is it? Let's back up again. Does the demand for labor solve the problem? The demand for labor has to do with the preparation of the people in education. And we got to make sure that the kids who, t the people who teach do a good job, incentivize them to do a good job. Stop barking about the union. It's obnoxious and a waste of breath. The next person that barks about the unions being the problem of American education, you can identify as an idiot. <laughs> Stand and up. a person who has no feel for the <laughs> solution. You talk about the people out of work. You talk about the food stamps. They don't like the food stamps. Oh, you can find some lazy SOB that likes being on welfare. But most people hate a handout. And you know that, and I know that. They want to be wealthy. They want to be successful. They want to be independent. They want to look good to women if they're a man. <laughs> they want to be dressed pretty if they're a woman. Help them. Well, how do we do it? We have to unleash American ambition. We got to take away the barriers that intimidate, the regulatory barriers that intimidate people to try. We got to keep making sure that we explain possibility in America. And if you think that Donald Trump or Steve Wynn or any combination of Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell and all these other people are gonna somehow wave their hand to come up with the answer, you're as delusional as they are. We each have to decide to get into this. But when we get into it, we got to decide. We're going to yell for more handouts or we're going to yell for more hand ups. It's the hand up that changes people's lives. And if I sound passionate about this, it's because I am. I got 20 or 30,000 employees and it's a family affair. But we incentivize in every conceivable way you can imagine the creation of our own internal culture. And if any of you have stayed at that hotel, you felt, you felt it, haven't you? Well, it didn't happen by accident. We followed a principle of incentivizing and rewarding the behavior we wish to encourage. It applies to the United States, to those people on welfare. It applies to the teachers teaching our kids. And you all got to do something about it. You can't come to an expensive international co financial conference and walk away. You'll get more information for sure, and you may be enlightened. But so um, totally different topic. You, you, there are cookies available. I asked. <laughs> totally different topic. So you in your resorts have significant retail, okay? Mm -hmm. Retail is a, uh, an ugly duckling sub subject these days. Uh, and the question is, what's going on with retail? What's its future? The retail business. I, I, own, I own a lot of that shit, so this is an important question. Go ahead. Retail's getting a lot of pressure from me. Yep, 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 yep. So there's a company called uh, New York Jewish Family Chera. Stanley Chera and his children they have a firm called uh, Crown. Crown. They specialize. They say that they're only interested in retail that's walk-in retail that won't be affected by the Internet. So they like Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue. And they like the win because, you know, 20 or 30,000 people a day are there. And they're, they come to Las Vegas for one You're reason. You're going to turn this into an advertisement. I want a generic answer. Well, the generic answer and is... I'm going to push for it. ...that retail <laughs> is going to be in trouble unless it's in a place where there's a monstrous crowd that's in the mood to shop. But if it's a shopping center uh, in a region, those shopping centers are having trouble. And, and that's the status of what's going on. Since, since I'm not suffering with that problem, I haven't focused on what to do about it. How about you? Uh, my my pal, my pal, Mr. Chair. I, well, first, I sold all my malls three years ago, but well, there you go. It's not but your problem. My my pal, uh, uh, Chira, who I who I'm very friendly with, good good friend. Whatever he's got on Fifth Avenue, I've got five times. So that's where I am. So we've made our retail bet by being the largest owner on Fifth Avenue, being the largest owner in Times Square, et cetera. What are you gonna do with 666 Fifth? 
you and the, and the, and the Kushners. <laughs> You're stuck with it. <laughs> Jarrett's in Washington. He can't be blamed. So you and Stanley and Jaime, you got to figure out what to do. You got that building. So, um, um, you know, I have the best lawyers in the world. I mean, <laughs> the best lawyers in the world. And so I asked them a very simple question. So by chance or whatever, I happen to be the 70%. I, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah, yeah. That one's mine. The other one's on the other side. Oh, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, you, got, you just had it. Okay. So uh, I'll keep you giving you mine. So um, um, I happen to be the 70% majority owner to several very important pieces of real estate, one in San Francisco, one in New York, that the president of the United States is the 30% partner. So I asked the, by, my smartest in the world lawyers, what does it get me by being the 70% senior partner to the president? And the learned answer from all of these lawyers was nothing. So with that as a background, um, so we own a building uh, in uh, partnership with uh, the, uh, the uh, Kushner family, who's the, uh, uh, the uh, son-in-law of the, of the uh, president, and um, it's complicated. Uh, very complicated and even more complicated than that and we'll see how the dice roll. Um, we are cooperating for an objective, an economic objective which um, uh, if it turns will be, you're giggling, I don't like that you're giggling. <laughs> You still got to rent that. No, no, because, no, but you're going to, well, you're going to try to get something out of me that you're, that even you are not going to be able to get out of me, okay? <laughs> 15,000 square feet on the ground, though. I, I own all of that. All, all, all the footprint. All the, all, the, all the stores on the ground I own separately. So anyway, so <clears throat> it's a partnership. Uh, it's cooperative, and um, we'll, we have some ideas. Uh, some of the very finest ideas come out of uh, Jared's father, and so we'll see how that goes. But it's going to be it's going to be um, it's going to be uh, fun. Richie, it's a, it's Richie a great Lefrac. it's a great piece of real estate. Rich Lefrac was was speaking here at this little bit of levity. Richie was speaking. It, enormous real estate family, huge apartment owners. Rich was spoke at this event the other day. And during the, uh, after the election, there were such monstrous uh, demonstrations in front of Trump Tower. It, it killed everything on Fifth Avenue. And Richie's headquarters, he owns a dozen office buildings and 20 or 5 or 30,000 apartments. But his office is 40, is 40 West 57th Street, which is right around the corner on the south side of 57th Street from Fifth Avenue. So it's right across from the side door of Bergdorf. And uh, it was all barricaded off he couldn't get into his garage so he called Donald's secretary in New York and said listen he's known Donald for 50 years they're best friends he says tell the president-elect I don't want to be in the cabinet I don't want to be in the as a ambassador I want to be in my garage will you please <laughs> fix the goddamn garage <laughs> so I told the president I said Donald uh, did you hear what what Richie said to, to Rona yesterday and I said, he wants to be in the garage. Is that funny or what? <laughs> he didn't laugh. He says, we're working on it. <laughs> he, didn't <laughs> he didn't think it was funny. Of, of all the national emergencies, that ranks number 733,000, okay? <laughs> so he, uh, he's doing a, he's, he's got all the right ideas. Reduce regulation, reform the tax, have the immigration be based on positive contribution to society. Fix the damn health care. Get people going again. He's right about that. He picked a good cabinet. We're going to have to get used to his personality. He is Donald Trump. He not, he's 70 years old. He's not going to change. But ask yourself this question. All you business people out there that had enough money to come to this conference, you better off with Schumer and Pelosi or you better off with, with Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. Because what, what they pass, he'll sign. And it'll be stuff that moves us more in the direction of where I think, if you're honest about the situation we ought to go, I don't think anybody, nobody has any idea of shipping 
uh, the un undocumented workers back to Mexico or wherever they came from. He is interested in shipping back people who've, who's deliberately violated the law beyond just coming here. And of course, he's absolutely correct on that point. Yeah, ask yourself this question. The fundamental question of our time. If you're a, a liberal, a raging liberal that wants open borders, is it okay for a person from another country to unilaterally, on their own, come through this country one way or another and make a unilateral self-determination that they are now residents of the United States entitled to all the benefits that flow therefrom? Is it okay to self-appoint yourself as a resident? Now that question answers itself by any logical methodology. And if, if, that's, if the answer to that question is that's not okay, then it's okay for a country morally, legally, and ethically to have immigration laws. No one has ever denied it, even the most lefty people. But then when you ask them, what about the rule of law? They, they, they talk about Bush or something. Can't get into the conversation. Trump says he wants to have lots of immigration, but he wants people to come here legally. Trump says he doesn't want to send all the people, the 11 million people back home. He wants to, to send back home drug dealers, criminals, gang members, and other antisocial, miserable creatures out of this country. Good, I think he should too. He doesn't want to fool with DACA. That allows the kids brought here as babies to stay. So I think the president's immigration thing is, had gotten a lot more reasonable and understandable. Well, the proof is in the pudding. In this, this is the most contentious election in our lifetime, I think, where uh, uh, lots of issues, startling issues, stark issues, were put on the table in very strident terms by both sides. And people were startled by that. That's right. And the, uh, the president, as a candidate, was aggressive and ambitious and willing to put it all out in very, very stark, strident terms. And it resonated, and that's why he was elected. So it's pretty interesting. So there- Turned a lot of people off because it was strident. Well, but, that, but, but, but that's, that's sort of my next point. So, one thing that this election did, as, uh, as, uh, as divisive as it was, as ugly as it was, was it got some things that uh, were pushed under the rug out on the table. For example, I think that this election showed that we are not as far along with race relations as we thought we were. And I think it's, a, it, it's not a bad thing to have that out on the table so that we can address it and we can deal with it and we can move forward constructively. And there's lots of other things like that. Now, I mean, Donald Trump was a, uh, a rookie. He wasn't a professional politician, although he followed it for years. He's been, he's been interested in politics for 25 years. And as he became a candidate, it, be, it, it, it became pretty obvious he was pretty savvy on all of the things that politicians deal with. So immigration was the first thing he came out of the gate with, and how did he know that that was really um, the biggest single thorn in the belly of the electorate? But he did. Now, my observation of the president, um, um, and by the way, we don't call him Donald, we call him the president, because he fills that role and he fills it very well. Um, and uh, even though, forget who we owe him, you know, for 30, 40, 50 years, he's the president. So um, he has shown in recent months a willingness and an ability to compromise. He has shown a, in recent months a desire to be uh, friendly and intimate with world leaders and legislators. And he has shown an ability to learn on the job at an unbelievably rapid pace, which I think is just absolutely brilliant. So in terms of optimism as to where we're going, what can be accomplished, I am um, um, bordering between very enthusiastic to joyous. 
Joyous. You got that? Joyous. Uh, what's the next topic? What do you want to talk about? How about we take questions? Okay. Since we... Let's go over there. Yes. Right there, you. The good-looking guy with the beard. So, uh, do I need a mic Louder. Stand on, the, stand on the chair and talk louder. Yeah, good. we can hear you. <laughs> we'll repeat your question. Go ahead. Mr. Wayne, I actually grew up in Las Vegas. I was born and raised. I'm late teens, so thank you for being my childhood larger than life. I uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, a question. So many of your contemporaries failed at creating a hotel and casino empires, but you succeeded. Besides incentives, what are some of the things that you understand at great depth that you think most of your contemporaries completely missed? What? what? If I understand it correctly, in, in being and doing my business, what is it that I understand that the other guys didn't? Yeah. <laughs> I said, what's, I, here we go, procedure. What's important? What determines the franchise? Guest experience. No argument about that, right? You have a good time in a hotel, you go, you'll come back again, you'll even pay more money next year for, to offset the cost of business going up. You'll tell your friends, we got a business. What determines guest experience? The carpet, the crystal chandeliers, the hand-woven fabrics, eh, 10%. Good taste is great, and it make you love the place, but 80 to 90% of the guest experience is determined by the way they're treated, because only people make people happy. So therefore, I come to the conclusion that my business challenge is to get my employees to give of themselves in a way that my secretary takes care of me or my wife takes care of me when Andrea cares about my welfare. So how do I do that? I cannot hire one supervisor for one employee. That would double the workforce and then who would watch them? So the only real way to create the, the culture I'm after is to have the employees watch themselves. So then I'm led to the next question in this sequence of, of uh, enlightenment. Guest experience in controlled by the line employees? Well, what's important to the line employees? Money? No. If people think they're being paid fairly, they're there. If they're being paid unfairly, it's another story. But once people have a little security and they think they're being paid fairly, money seeks to be a moment-to-moment -moment incentive. The strongest thing in human dynamics is self-esteem. Anything that makes someone feel good about themselves will be repeated incessantly. Because when you look in the mirror and you like what you see, you are happy. People's, people's sense of themselves is the most important thing. And anything that makes, that make, everyone wants to belong to the club they can't get into. Everybody wants to be part of the best. They hold up their finger at the basketball game. The Duke people with their faces half blue. They're not even they not a dribble, but they're going, no, nah, we're number one. Everybody wants to belong to the, to the best. And if working at win makes you the best, then this is important to you as an employee, then you're going to worry about the win in a way that Steve worries or Andrea worries. And all of a sudden, you don't like it when the guy next to you is screwing up the place. Because by screwing up the place, he's screwing up something that has to do with my sense of myself. So the secret has been human resources and getting a culture instead of a payroll. That's why I've never done a layoff. That's not the greatest answer to your question I ever heard, okay? So let, let me give it to you from my version. Number one, Steve Wynn, with a little bit of financing from Mike Milken, single-handedly invented the modern Las Vegas 100 years ago. He single-handedly created Las Vegas, okay? He did it because he's enormously talented. He didn't know that he was talented, okay, until he started getting it, and then it turned out he's enormously talented. He is one of the top three real estate developers that I know, okay, because that's what he does. And I don't know who the first, first uh, who the other two are, okay? Steve, I gotta tell you a story. No, 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 just, I'm not done yet. Just okay. relax, sit okay. back and relax, okay? I'll, I'll cue you. Okay? okay. By the way, we have four minutes and 16 seconds left. We're going to use every second of it. Okay. So this is enormous talent. He looks at things in a totally different way than normal people do. He understands 
how the layout goes. He understands. And, and the first place that he starts with is attractive, beautiful, welcoming, etc. But the fr and I've, done, I've been through this with him for 35 years. The first place he starts with is where's the employee break room? Where's the employee locker room? Where do they change? Where do they come in? Where do they park their cars? Okay? And so, and it goes, how do you train them? Okay? So when he opens a new hotel, he calls them joints. Okay? When he opens a new joint, it's got three or four thousand employees. How do you train three or four thousand employees? So on the first day that it's open, it's rocking and it's ready to go and it's performing. He does it by moving it. So by moving seasoned people in and have a, so what I'm saying is there's a level of talent which is world, world, he, he competes at the highest level with everybody in the world. He is the outstanding developer in the world. And he does it from the humanity and what, uh, uh, what happened. All right, all right. No, 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 I'm not done yet. Okay? By the way, he also figured out how to do the same thing with the Chinese culture. Because he's, he's, he's big in Macau. Okay. Next. You want the next question? Yes. Hi. Um, Serena Rosso is my I, name. Um, I'm from Australia and I just want to congratulate Steve Wynn on jobs because I've been standing for jobs, education and training for the last 38 years. As an influencer of the President, and I'm so thrilled that you are a, a positive influence, it's great to have jobs, but what are you going to do with the people who are being left behind? You know, welfare to work, you know, homelessness, drugs, um, diversity. What sort of, what's the policy here in America to help those people who also deserve a job? And once again, congratulations, Steve. Um, if Anthony Robbins was here, he'd be jealous. Thank you. I heard all the buzzwords. What do I do about diversity and the people left behind? Talking to a Democrat. That's the question. <laughs> yeah, you know you're talking, why? You're talking to an Aussie. It's a, it, it, it's a lovely lady and, and I, I'm going to have to take the other side. I don't care about diversity because I'm colorblind. And I want to encourage a world that is. But I'm not going to say the government's going to fix this. We're going to fix this. I'm going <laughs> to... Diversity. I made a woman president of the Golden Nugget in 1978. Diversity. I don't know the difference between boys and girls when they get their clothes on and they're at work. And I don't care. So I'm going to set a good example. And I'm going to keep setting a good example. But I have to share with you the moment when I got wisdom. I want to tell you exactly how I found out everything that I think is responsible for success. It was back in the early 80s. And the Golden Nugget of Atlantic City was open and it was successful. And in 1982, there was a recession in Atlantic City and they laid off people at the competitive hotels. And all the employees in my place, the whole town was morbid. And there was a lot of talk in the dealer's room and in the waiters in the break area, who's next? They laid off people at, at, the, at the resorts and at Caesars and the Bally. And it was, the whole place was jumpy. And they were waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I saw this happening and it concerned me. So I decided because of something that had happened in my life by coincidence, I knew something. And I decided to call a meeting of the 350 employees that supervise three or more of the 3,500 other employees. And I said, and, I, and with the 24 hours, you have to do two meetings because of the shift change. And in the afternoon, I called a meeting of the me and there were 200 people in the room. And I got introduced and they were wondering what's going on, the boss is gonna have a talk. I said, now look, you've all been reading the paper about the problems in this town. We're part of the community, we can't forget that. And, and we, we're no better than the rest of the community. What happens to them happens to us. And you could see in their faces, oh, here it comes. Oh God, here it comes. I said, and they've had layoffs. They've had to cut back the workforce at Caesars and Bali and all those places and resorts. We have to recognize that and do our part in this community. So starting tomorrow, I had already made the phone calls. Representatives of Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors will be at our Intercept parking lot with models of Mercury's, 
Chevys and uh, the other car, the Pontiacs. Each of you is to pick out a color and a model. I'm buying each of you a new car, insurance paid, and I'm gonna, and, and we have to set an example in this town. There was a moment of silence because they thought it was a bad joke. And then someone yelled, whoa! <laughs> and the place went crazy. And when they calmed down, I said, look, it's gonna cost about five million for this. But if you get in that car, whether you give it to your daughter or your son or your girlfriend or your wife or you keep it yourself, when you get in that car and you turn on the key, and new cars smell good. <laughs> if you say to yourself, I gotta get the job done with the people that I touch today in that hotel. If you do that, if you reach out and create a moment with someone that's in that hotel, then you'll have made the price of this car zero. And that's all I care about. Well, I finished the first group. By the time I did the second group, the word was out. The place was crazy. It was a slow day on news. It was a Tuesday in July, and it made the CBS Evening News. Well, what happened next changed my life. I had done this. It was on the news. It was a big, a big puffy thing, blah, blah, blah. I walked into the hotel on the boardwalk in Atlantic City the next day, and the most stunning thing hit me in the face. Before I could get through the door, the doormen, non-supervisors, no cars. The doormen said, congratulations, Mr. Wynn, this is the greatest thing we ever saw. I walked by the front desk and the kids at the front desk yelled at me, good going, Steve. I went into the casino and all the dealers were lit up and yapping at the customers. What I saw dazzled me. The people who didn't get the car realized that if I was willing to give cars to their bosses, they sure as hell weren't gonna get laid off. And they sure as hell, maybe all those other joints were in trouble. But the Golden Nugget was powerful and they were in the powerful place and they were the best. And I saw the unleashing of human energy with and unintended consequences. I didn't have a clue this was gonna happen this way. But I was met with a tsunami of human positive energy because I had touched the deepest part of their self-esteem and their sense of security. And we had made 27 million for the first half of the year and we finished the second half at 108 million on a $120 million hotel. Unbelievable, 80 million in the second six months. You wanna tell me about the power of human energy? Yeah, and that's when I learned about what it meant to tap in to the real deep souls of people and telling them that, they, that things could be better. Tell a happy guy that he's gonna be sick next week and he's miserable today. Tell someone in pain that they're gonna feel good in three days and the pain stops right now. Our state of mind is a reflection of our sense of the future. Donald Trump has given a sense of, of us of a better future, but he's gonna need a lot of help to buttress his rhetoric and his fine intentions. And if you guys think that this is an avenue worth pursuing, find me and send money. We got, a, we got an account called Strength in the Majority. Uh, Corey Gardner and I made a JV so that the money goes into strengthening in the Senate so that Mitch McConnell can put stuff on Donald Trump's desk that gets the job done. Ryan only needs 51 votes. The, the guy in the Senate's got a bigger hill to climb. But you gotta decide for yourself what you wanna do about diversity. But if you think that someone named Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or one of those kinds of people is going to tell you that they can do it with the wave of their hand because they got a big fat microphone, then you're naive and you haven't learned the truth yet. We've got to do it ourselves, people. Okay, so we're five minutes over. We covered the skyline. 
And thank you all very much. The uh, lunch is in five minutes with President Bush. Thank you all very much. <laughs>